Welcome to New Testament. Today we are going to explore the Bible, the most influential book in the history of the world. It has been used and abused in many different ways. It has been used as a source for promoting peace and justice, tolerance and understanding. It has been used as a source for promoting um, genocide, war, violence. Um, Christianity is heavily indebted to the Bible and the way people interpret the Bible has a profound impact on their particular version of Christianity. We are going to uh, first acknowledge that there are many different ways that people read the Bible. I could ask, okay, uh, fortune telling. Um, should I ask Sally to the prom? And then I can look in the book and I can say, now there was a war between two people. Wow, maybe that would be a bad idea. Maybe that's foretelling that God would be angry with me. Okay, actually, that's not the way I would interpret the Bible. As a biblical scholar, I use a method called the historical critical method. Rather than focusing on how God is speaking to me through this book at this particular moment, which is what theologians often do, and I I am not here criticizing theology, but students at Culver Stockton College come from many different backgrounds. They are not expected to sign a statement of faith. I assume that some of the students taking this class will be Christians, some will not. Um, the goal of the course is not to convert people to Christianity, but the goal is to help them to understand this particular book, particularly how the original authors of this book sought to influence their original audiences. We are less concerned with the questions of theology and what that might mean for people today, although I've already suggested that the way people interpret the Bible does have profound impact um, on contemporary society, politics, um, and a number of other areas that will be important to you as a human being. So. If I am not going to be interpreting this book using fortune telling, I'm also not going to be using a literal approach. Uh, the literal approach is actually a modern phenomena constructed in large part by Charles Hodge of Princeton University, who was critical of modernist ways of interpreting the Bible. And he chose to insist that God told each of the biblical authors exactly what to write and that if anyone sees a contradiction in the text, they're basically going to hell. Um, there was a time where I believe I brought that particular lens to the interpretation of the Bible, and I couldn't read the Bible, at least not in a way that uh, I felt uh, was inspiring and helped me to understand uh, who Jesus of Nazareth was. To give you more insights in historical critical scholarship, um, tools that have been used for about 150 years and uh, tools that you would expect to find at mainline Protestant and at Roman Catholic seminaries, for example. I went to a uh, seminary and uh, we learned these methods there. They're also found in state universities. But historical critical method, the goal is to understand how the original author of a text sought to influence his or her original audience. So, there are six tools we're going to talk about in this course. Form criticism, audience criticism, text criticism, source criticism, redaction criticism, and canon criticism. Form criticism says that in order to evaluate any piece of literature, we need to understand the form of the literature. For example, if there is something that is a parable or an allegory, if it is a metaphor, the expression, God is my rock. I don't worship rocks. I'm not taking that as a literal statement of scientific or historical fact that God is a rock. When I say God is my rock or it's found in the scriptures, that means that God is a foundation. God is solid. God is uh, my support. Um, I think there are many people who claim to take a literal approach to the Bible who, when asked, uh, would say, no, of course I don't worship rocks. Uh, everybody knows if you misunderstand the form of the literature, you're going to get it wrong. 
There are numerous examples of where form criticism is helpful, but if we misunderstand the form of the literature, we're likely to misunderstand what the author's intention was. We're going to start by looking at the Gospels. The Gospels are proclamations of the good news, the news that Jesus is the Christ. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Paul present five different portraits of Jesus. They each insist that Jesus is the Messiah, even though they have different, at times, images of who the Messiah is, what the Messiah does. So we need to know that the Gospels were not um, 21st century history. They're not 21st century biography. For example, the Gospels tell us very little about Jesus before he is about 30 years old and begins his ministry after being baptized by John the Baptist. The second tool of historical critical scholarship, audience criticism, identifies the author's intended audience. In the real world, if you're writing something, it's usually because you have a specific audience in mind. In, you know, I, in education, sometimes someone says just to write something and I'm going to ask you to write essays as well. Um, if you misunderstand the relationship between the author and the audience, or you don't understand who the audience was, you're likely to misunderstand the point. For example, Jesus often uses the expression kingdom of God, and he sets the kingdom of God in contrast to the Roman Empire. Now today, when he, we hear the expression kingdom of God, we often think of heaven after we die. But in the first century of the Common Era, most Romans assumed that the Roman Empire was the kingdom of God. And for Jesus to be talking about the kingdom of God and setting it in contrast to the Roman Empire, uh, that would have been very offensive. The expression, king of the Jews, um, at the time it's important to note that the Romans had colonized the Jews and they were the ones who got to decide who the king of the Jews was. At the time of Jesus' birth, uh, they had appointed King Herod. Uh, when he died, uh, the kingdom was divided into three separate categories. Uh, there are certain terms that change. Methinks thy mother tongue hath not changed one iota uh, in the past four score. Okay, what I've done is I've showed you how language has changed. If I say that uh, God is my king, today I don't mean to say that God is uh, a figurehead who has no power, but that's what kings mean today. Um, if you misunderstand the original context, another example would be Son of God. And every coin in the Roman Empire, uh, Caesar printed Phileas Divi, the Son of a God, on his coins. Now, if we don't understand how the expression, Jesus as the Son of God, was seen as a threat to Caesar, we're unlikely to understand uh, the impact, how the original audience would have heard these stories. The next tool is text criticism. The goal is to identify the original text, if possible. Uh, we don't have the actual handwritten accounts from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Obviously, you are looking at translations. Uh, most of the Old Testament is in Hebrew. The New Testament is written in Greek. Jesus spoke Aramaic. If we want to try to reconstruct exactly what Jesus said, what he did, when he said it, when he did it, we kind of have to go through, it's kind of like the operator game. One person says something to somebody else, that person tells the story to the next person in line. By the time uh, you get through several people, the story may or may not have changed. Um, what we want to do in biblical scholarship is to get back as close as possible to the original text um, because if we want to see how the original author influenced the original audience and we're using a mistranslation of a later version of a text, uh, we're going to run into much more difficulty. Most text critical scholars concur there are no fragments of the New Testament older than the year 125 of the Common Era and uh, no copies of the Hebrew Bible older than the second century before the Common Era. The next tool of historical critical scholarship is source criticism. And we ask, how does the author know what he or she claims to know? Most biblical scholars uh, looking at the New Testament conclude that 
The Gospel of Mark was written first and used as a source by Matthew and Luke, who used most of Mark's Gospel. They each added their own infancy narratives and their own resurrection accounts. They had other stories, including some stories that are some sayings of Jesus that are the same in both texts, which has led scholars to conclude there must be another source, Q. Scholars don't believe that Matthew read Luke or Luke read Matthew because um, they don't agree on where and when Jesus says these things that are common to Matthew and Luke but not found in Mark. In any event, if we're trying to understand how Mark was influencing his audience, it's a good question to ask how does he know what he claims to know. Uh, you'll be reading about each of the authors and their respective audiences in the Airman book, and you'll have some insights uh, from the video as well into what scholars think is happening. The next tool is redaction criticism. If we know that Matthew used Mark as a source, then we can set them side by side, and when Matthew changes the story, we can ask why. For example, Matthew often changes the expression Kingdom of God in Mark to Kingdom of Heaven. So using redaction criticism, we might ask, uh, why is he changing the story? The Gospel of John puts the story of Jesus' arrest at the beginning of his ministry. The other three Gospels have it at the end. Uh, why does he change it? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all use the Old Testament as a source for um, filling in details about Jesus' life. If we know that, we can look at the passages that they are citing and ask if there are any changes, how and why. The final tool of historical critical scholarship is canon criticism. Uh, the goal is to understand how did these books come to be put together into a Bible and circulated as such. There are 27 books in the New Testament, but if you look at many of the earliest Christians, uh, the very earliest Christians did not have a Bible. The Bible as we know it did not get its final form until uh, sometime in the late 4th century. Athanasius was the first Christian to include all 27 books in the New Testament while excluding books like the Gospel of Hermes, the Gospel of the Nazareans, the Gospel of the Ebionites. Uh, there are a number of other Gospels, uh, Thomas and Jude, you may have heard of some of these. Um, the question is how did some of these come to be included in the Bible? And why is it that others uh, were not included? Um, one thing we're going to do later in the course is to compare the sayings of Jesus found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with the sayings as they are presented in some of the non-canonical Gospels. Part of the reason we do that is because if we want to reconstruct what Jesus actually said, the more independent sources we have saying the same thing increase the probability for historians that that is accurate. Um, one should be careful to note the word critical and historical critical does not simply imply negative evaluations. Instead, it implies uh, careful judgments uh, based on reasons and well-considered arguments. There are some people who are critical of historical critical scholarship because at times it may lead to people challenging uh, statements found in the scriptures. For me, as a Christian, I don't assume you all are Christians, but it really does matter who Jesus was, what he said, and what he did. And I would like to use reason as much as possible, use science as much as possible to reconstruct what Jesus actually said and did. Um, some people say they would prefer to have an image that is ideal. I kind of think that's like saying, you know, I would rather be married to uh, a woman who won the beauty contest, the Polar Surprise, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, and uh, if I were to describe, you know, my wife or girlfriend that way, people would be saying, he must not really love the actual human being he's with. I feel like the same is true with Jesus. If we want to understand who he was, we do him greater honor by trying to understand what he actually said and did and peel back the layers of interpretation. I hope you enjoy this course. I know for me, um, 
these tools have helped me to really enjoy uh, reading the Bible and feel like I understand uh, what was happening at the time in which the Bible was written. Enjoy.